Hey there, Don't Go Out There listeners. This is Brian. Uh, thank you for listening to one of our earlier episodes. I uh, just wanted to give a little warning that we had some sound quality issues uh, due to some technical difficulties during this particular one. Uh, we still feel like there is some good content in there, though, so we definitely appreciate you listening. Just turn that volume on up after the uh, intro music. Uh, thanks again for listening. You can find all kinds of other content as well at www.dontgooutthere.com. And remember, don't go out there. Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. This is Nick Castle, Michael Myers in the original Halloween. There he is, always over my shoulder. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. In a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist, welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. to episode two of the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to episode one, uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, tonight, we're going to be reviewing a classic and my man, Mike Settle's favorite movie, horror movie of all time, I believe. Halloween, 1978, John Carpenter. Obviously a trend-setting movie. He, you can argue that it started the whole slasher genre. I'm pretty sure that's yeah. what the case. But um, tonight, before we get into the actual review, we're going to talk about uh, just our, you know, just some simple thoughts on Halloween and Michael Myers, the villain himself. Um, Brian, what are your thoughts on uh, Michael Myers? I have gone back and forth with, with, with this a lot, especially growing up. But um, I think I like the supernatural version of Michael Myers more than I do the human version of Michael Myers. And I just it just to me it makes him makes him more scary. And I mean I know we'll get into this at the end, but you know, I know whenever uh, Loomis shoots him at the end, um and you know, he, he's gone, you're supposed to kind of be left with, oh shit, like is he is he human? You know, is he is he not? And you know, that's something they kind of play with a little bit more in the movies and got him more, I think, to the supernatural level. And to me, like I said, that makes him more scary. It's kind of like Jason. Like I, I'm way, I'm a way bigger fan of the zombie Jason than I am the uh, the human Jason. I agree with that. He's just uh, the embodiment of evil. You know, he just it, it, it's never really explained like what caused it or what what the root of it was. But um, yeah, he's just a started off as an evil little kid and now he's a super super villain behind the. Captain Kirk mask, it's awesome. Um, Mike, I know this is your favorite guy, so tell me if it's your basic thoughts about him in the franchise. I think he's my favorite guy if we're just going off the first movie and then the sequels that I like. There's a couple, you know, <laughs> there's a couple movies in there where uh, they do some things that I'm not a fan of. But no, the, the character, and, and to touch on what Drew said, the absence of life is essentially kind of what he is. He's pink, or, you know, this blank, pale, emotionless face, as Dr. Loomis says in the first movie. He's he, he's the true embodiment of evil. And even what Brian said, the supernatural edge, I kind of like the toe of the line. The, is he, is he human? Is he not human? And you don't really know, and as the movies go along, the whole series goes along, you still don't know, because he is a human, you know, we see him as a kid, but there's clearly some supernatural element there you're not really supposed to know and this original movie was supposed to be a one-off so that's why you really don't know because John Carpenter left it open-ended so he's my favorite I like the mask the best out of all the mm-hmm. masks that are on slashers the original there's some masks in this series that are really really shitty but I really like that original mask I like the I like the outfit he ends up uh, wearing in the series uh, the mechanic jumpsuit 
And I think because the way that, and we're going to talk about it, the way the music has been used with Michael, it really helps him. The mood, the atmosphere, the, mm-hmm. all that stuff, I think it helps him with me. So to me, he's just the scariest. I know he's not everyone's favorite because clearly Jason, I can see why he might be someone's favorite because he's just killing people left and right. He's a complete badass, especially the Kane Hodder version. And I can see why Freddie might be because Freddie's funny. <laughs> I mean, come on. Freddie's hilarious, but I, I just like that scary, supernatural Elliot, uh, element with Michael Myers. Well, I think, One thing that's touched on that I like, um, that I agree with, is the mask. That I wish they would have been consistent throughout the series with the same mask, because like in um, the H2O version, oh. the movie, and Josh Hartnett, the mask is so <laughs> awful in that movie. It's like, yeah. how did that get approved? But, you know, that's for a... That's a different movie. Right. right. Halloween 4 and H2O have awful masks, and they're both good movies that they have better masks. I know that's really weird to say, but they ruined those two movies. That, that mask makes Michael, you know. It's yeah. His, it's his signature. That and the, his knife is his signature. All right. Uh, Mike, you want to uh, lead us into – or Brian, do you have any other thoughts real quick, or do you want to go ahead and go into this? Okay. Well, I mean, Mike brought up King Hodder and, and Jason, but, like, I think that – Nick Castle's performance as Michael Myers, especially in this movie, and I mean he did it again in 2018, you know, Halloween. But I mean he, I think Kane Hodder mirrored a lot of what he did after Nick yeah. Castle's performance because you know his little ticks because he's unable to speak, so you have to convey you know emotion through you know him turning his head when he stabs Bob, you know that we'll talk about later. But you know things like that, I think that. Nick, Nick Castle's performance as Michael Myers is what set the trend for for moving forward. Absolutely. Mike, you want to take us into this opening scene? Into yeah, man, let's do it. Classic. Yeah, hey, I know I said last week that the Freddy thing might have been my favorite. Man, this opening scene is great because you really don't know that you're seeing it from young Michael Myers' point of view until you start seeing the little eye holes. Uh-huh. And so you, it's just walking up the house and it's outside the house and you don't you're like what is this shot what is you know what, what is going on here and then he puts on the mask and you're like oh we're we're seeing this from the killer's perspective and to, to my recollection that's the first time that's ever been done I, I don't know another time and you really and by the way you also don't know it's a little kid until the reveal when he takes the mask off and so this scene is great and I like you know he's okay so you know Judith Myers is being killed. Uh-huh. But you don't, but you, you don't see the violence that much, and I know a lot of people love the blood and guts and gore, and I do too. Like I like a good kill, but this movie did a really good job with just making you feel the kill more than see the kill. I know some people don't like that, but I think it kind of adds to the suspense for me. And so, and by the way, you get to see uh, naked Judith Myers, but you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you, know, the first, you know, the first four minutes into the movie, you see a naked woman. And imagine that in 1978. That didn't go over very well. But no, man, I love this scene. I think it's great. And I love the usage of the reveal at the end. You notice it's a little kid. And you just don't see it coming the first time you watch it. Brian, go ahead. What's your thoughts? Well, actually, this is, people may not know, but the, I believe it's the only time that blood is seen any time in this movie. Isn't um, that crazy? That's crazy. Yeah, and but and I'll tell you what I mean. Mike's I agree with Mike all the way up into the kill. I think that, and her name's Sandy Johnson, by the way. But like her, her her acting, her no, acting in that is yeah. is is it's terrible, bad. almost to the point where like oh gosh, that's where she oh I'm gonna scream a couple of times and just fall over instead of you know a realistic performance, which I think we talked about a little bit last week. I'm I'm a little bit more into the. It keeps me in it if it's right. realistic to me. And to be honest with you, though, that, that one's like one of the few ones in there. Like you, while I was watching it, I was like, it got like the hair kind of just stands up. Like you just get right. like it kind of intensifies in that beginning. And then I'm a big like as Mike Mike said about the music, with the music that went along with it. It just kind of got my heart pumping a little bit more. And uh, the camera work to me is insane. In this just the whole movie, but the the very first part, the different angles that they took on it, like like I said, you just didn't know what it's coming from until you saw the two holes and until it was revealed after, is um a very good start to the beginning of the movie. So some some movies, one of like the movies, the biggest thing I have against movies is if they start off slow, it pisses me off. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I want to jump on something that Mike said. Um, he he said that 
you when you feel the kill, you don't see the kill in these movies. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes this Halloween to me uh, the best of you know the I thought the old school part of the series, you know, before the remakes and all that. Just um, John Carpenter didn't use Michael Myers and that knife to stab somebody over and over and over to make them scared. He just used he used the, um, the atmosphere he used his his score he used the uh the you know the camera where he just right. he, he did everything perfect to me to make you feel scared and not have you know a creepy kid in a clown mask or a giant villain with a mask on to kill someone he didn't he didn't use the actual villain to be scared he used the the atmosphere to be scared go ahead brian i saw you raise your hand well no and and drew can relate to this especially like when you're talking about it being you know raising the hair in your arms like having kids adds another level to this too because you think what's probably your worst nightmare in the world is something you can't control and is your your child doing something like that so and and i know for me especially and stuff like paranormal activity too like things like that it really it hits me at a different level oh absolutely you have kids that's a great point uh, one thing I will say, but Mike, before, I, before you jump in, um, the boyfriend in this movie is a lot luckier than like, Mike got it in and got out of there. And that's the hardest thing he ever did. Like, yes. <laughs> Man. The Rob Zombie remake. Hey, ain't going to lie, though. That, that's the only thing about that's, – that's one thing, and I know we're going to talk about it another time, but that's one thing about the Rob Zombie remake that, that, that kind of makes me angry is that I kind of wanted that dude to die. And so you – like – you're kind of at the point where you want little kid Michael to kill everyone in his family because they suck. Yeah, yeah. And I get, I, I, I guess that was his point, but that's not scary to me. That you know what I mean? I just thought that for the budget that John Carpenter had, I mean, and he had a shoestring budget, okay, especially at the time. Um, the way that he used the camera, the way that he used the lighting, the mood lighting. Just the way it shot the mu- and by the way, they showed this movie with the music, the score, and everything else to a test audience, and they hated it. You know, the music to me is actually a character too. It is a character in this right. movie. It's probably the second main character because without it, this movie's kind of slow. I'll give you that. But the way they use the music, the camera, the shots, I just think that it makes it a masterpiece of horror. Like, like I know it's it's a little old. There's some stuff that's dated. We'll get into it. But just as far as, like, what I want from a horror movie, they do such a good job. Like, even the scene after the opening scene where it's the nurse and Loomis riding in a car. Like, if you're watching that dark, it's pouring down rain. You can clearly tell they're not riding down the street. Uh, okay. But it doesn't take me out of the scene. They, the, the way Loomis talks, the mood, the atmosphere, the music they play just a little bit here and there is so creepy to me. And I, I just think they do a great job on the budget that they had. I agree. Go ahead, Brian. You got any thoughts? Well, I mean, the original script, The Babysitter Murders, is what it was called. And it had it taking place over, like, several days. And for budget reasons, they had to cut it down into just one. But I think the budget restrictions forced and really show how much of a genius John Carpenter was. I mean, you have to force – it forces you to focus more on script and, and character development. And – um, I mean, what can you say? I mean, like you said, this this started the whole horror movement, I believe. I mean, you can say what you want about Psycho, but I believe there was no Freddy and there was no Jason without this movie. No. Right. And and to touch on Psycho, you, you could say it's the great-granddad of slashers, but – so I'll say this. I think Psycho is the great-granddad, even though to me that's not a slasher, but I, I get what people will link that to. Uh, that's more of a psychological movie. Um Black Christmas, which I know not everyone here has seen, is probably the granddad of slashers because of the way they set that movie up. It's probably and then, but Michael Myers is everyone's daddy. Like just as far as <laughs> as like babysitters or teenagers being slashed with a weapon at night, you know, that's kind of where that kicked off. Where Freddy, where just, I mean, even I mean, even Wes Craven has and definitely Friday the I mean Friday the Thirteenth was pitched as let's rip Halloween off. That's literally the pitch, and it worked. Like I'll give Friday the Thirteenth a lot of credit, but the base is clearly uh, John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween. All right, Mike, Mike brought it up, but uh, after the uh, scene with um, Young Mike, which is another, you know, there there are so many visuals in this movie that 
are just stick out to your mind. You know, the picture of the parents, you know, when they first pull up and they see young Michael with the butcher's knife in his hand with the blood on it. Iconic visual. Well, there's a ton of. We're gonna bring them up at the end of the at the end of this review. But um, we got Loomis and we got the nurse driving, heading to the uh, the I will call it the insane asylum, I guess. And um, we noticed that a lot of people have broken out. And this is actually kind of a nitpick of mine, but I won't get too bad into it. Like, how the hell Michael knows how to drive? <laughs> <laughs> it's a nitpick of mine too, and it's one of my favorites. I think everybody will bring that up. Right, right. But another thing I thought was kind of dumb was how dumb the nurse was in the car. It's like, oh, uh, it like went in there, but, you know. Um, she's dumber in Halloween, too. Anyway. So, um, do y'all have any thoughts on this scene? or? We were I, I don't. I actually just kind of agree with you. Yeah. Like, it's not a bad scene. It's not a very memorable scene other than, than uh, he. I mean, I think this is the Loomis where he refers to Mike Myers as it and not him. Or he says something along the lines of, you know, if that's what you want to call him, or what, you know, whatever it says. He refer, he's basically saying this guy's not human; he's pure evil. And I think this is kind of where we get the note. Where now I will say this: as much as I love this movie, and you said the thing about the driving, but man, <laughs> you see Michael Myers hop on the hood of the car in like a uh, what is essentially looks like a hospital gown. Yeah, uh, I still laugh. I laughed the first time I saw it, and it, it did take me out of the movie, but 40-something uh, years later, it's kind of, it doesn't age all that great. But that's a small nitpick. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That one scene is like, eh, but, you know. Yeah. It, I guess it could have been worse. But oh, yeah, definitely, it definitely could have been worse. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't like a super, super scene or nothing like that, but it definitely could have been way worse. Again, we have Freddy's Dead and other crappy Halloween movies that were much worse than that scene. See that, but see I, when I watched when I rewatched it, like you know, I, I kind of took the other movies out of my head. I didn't compare them. Yeah. I, just, I was just like, yeah. you know what? Let me just act like I haven't seen it like ever and just watch it like I would a normal movie. Like when I watched it too the other night, you know, I just go into it and I'm like, okay, let me see what it's got. Even though I mean, it's been a while since I actually watched the original, to be honest. All right. So, um, now. Uh... After the uh, Smith Grove incident, um, now we're getting ready to meet the main, the main final girl. I think of all time, I'll, right? Arguably, you know her, Nancy from Nightmare on Elm Street, the two most famous final girls. But um, now we meet Lori Strode. She's uh, with her. Um, let me get my notes. She, she's she's meeting a young kid that she's babysitting. And they're walking to school. And this is where we kind of meet grown-up Michael Myers. Um, he's walking up to the old Myers house. And the kid says, uh, his name is Tommy, I'm sorry. And he says, hey, what are you doing going up there? That's the haunted house. He's like, well, i got to drop a key off. And she drops the key off. And then all of a sudden you hear, this is another great usage of the, uh, you know, the sounds and the score that John Carpenter done. She drops the key off. And then you're inside the house from Michael's POV. They do a great job with POV shots in this movie. Oh yeah. And you hear the, you know, you hear the iconic noise, and you see from Michael's point of view inside the house, and you're like, oh boy, something, something something's happening. And now they start walking to school, and um, then after Lori and Tommy split, Lori's walking down the sidewalk. Then all of a sudden, Michael's out on the sidewalk watching her walk away. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on that, Michael? Uh, I mean, it just kind of gets it kind of gets you in the mindset of okay. So here's the thing: even before all that happens, they introduce you to the town of Haddonfield. They do a great job of making South Central LA look like the middle of the Midwest. Now there's a you know there's a few things in there, you know the palm tree and stuff, but they really do a good job making it feel like Midwestern Falls. So at least they got the atmosphere. Right, especially on the budget they had. Um, but the scene itself kind of sets up, to me, the reason. So a lot of people question why Michael kept falling around Tommy in the later scenes. But to me, this is why. He saw him with Lori Strode, and he, he, he gets a trigger in his mind. Wherever he is, I'll find Lori again. And so I know he's, he's just kind of, he's on that sidewalk, he's stalking Lori, and in his mind, okay, I'm going to come back for her, 
And I know the scene where she, uh, you know, she meets up with all her friends. You can tell he's really, really still focused in on Lori Strode. And, and this scene kind of sets that up. It's not like the most memorable scene, but I do like the usage of the Myers house, how he goes back in there. And I, I think it's it's really smart to do because they said, hey, you know, Haddonfield's really far away, but Michael Myers still made it there anyway. So that, I mean, this scene just kind of sets up a lot going forward. Oh, yeah. Brian? Well, like you said earlier but, uh, about the shots, you know, especially the over-the-shoulder shots and stuff that they used here to kind of, you know, not really show you Myers, but just show you that he was there and, and watching the uh, the cinematographer. Man, he he, uh, he deserves a lot of credit here. Like the you know, about, yeah. okay, what's that his name? Yeah. The uh, you know, the, at, at Smith's Grove, like that. You know, whether the scene's kind of cheesy or not, but the, the lightning hitting at the beginning and they're pulling up and then bam, you see everybody kind of standing around. Like, those are just iconic shots that are, you know, just aren't done, you know, after this movie. And, um, you know, when you talk about Jamie Lee Curtis being the, the final the uh, the final girl, I mean, she, where acting is a little bit eh, on this movie, a lot of them are, but, you know, she was the... The virgin final girl before that was even a cliche you know this right. created that oh yeah yeah um after we see this go on we uh it uh, goes over to smith's grove where um dr loomis and the head i, I wrote down i call him the head honcho <laughs> yeah the head honcho of smith's grove they're walking out and the uh the, the guy work, who works at smith's grove really doesn't take uh dr loomis's uh you know please for or you know, his desperate or desperate cries of like, this is a serious situation. He doesn't really take him too seriously. And um, I just want to give uh, Doctor Loomis a big shout out. He's probably my favorite you know, character in this movie, besides um, you know, obviously Michael. But, you know, they're on two different sides of the spectrum. But uh, Loomis, I think Loomis does a great job in this movie portraying just how truly evil and um, how dangerous of a situation this is. Do you guys have any thoughts on Doctor Loomis, real quick? Man, Donald Pleasance brings so the actor Donald Pleasance brings so much to this character. And at the time, he was the actor they paid the most for. But I felt like that's that was so worth it. It's such an iconic character, and a lot of stuff I remember from this movie are his lines. You know, his, you know the blank, pale, emotionless face line. The I've seen him in a room for 15 years. Staring at the wall, not seeing the, like that whole like he does a great job with just memorable, really memorable quotes from this film, and man, he does a great job just uh, kind of letting you know, hey, this guy is for real. You better take me seriously. And like you said, this idiot at Smith's Grove, he does. I mean, they've housed this guy for however many years now, and they still don't take what Loomis has to say seriously. And uh, you know, it's funny you say that because in this scene, that guy says, "How would he know how to drive?" or whatever he says. And, and Loomis goes, he was doing very well last night, and, <laughs> and walks off. And that's probably one of my favorite parts of that scene. Is, is just he's at least acknowledging maybe somebody here taught him how, which I guess kind of covers their tracks. Eh, I guess if you really want to go there with it. But no, I I think Donald Pleasance is great as Doctor Loomis. Agreed. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I think Doctor Loomis is my favorite character, not just in this movie, but the entire franchise. I mean, I think that to me. He is more important than Michael Myers. He's more important than yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis. You know, yeah. he's the he's the exposition, and that's all his character is is to explain things to you. But Donald Pleasant, Donald Pleasance is such a like he's such a good actor that I mean he's the one that makes Michael Myers scary. I mean he's the one that tells you why you as an audience should be scared of this guy, and you buy it because of his acting. I mean he, he he's dedicated his entire life as a doctor to this, and you know like I said. He tells you what you should be thinking, and, and you buy it. Yeah, I agree with that, man. He um, he, he becomes that obsessed, you know, that obsessed, uh, you know, doctor, scientist, whoever becomes completely consumed with his work and his time. And he does a great job of portraying it, man. And um, I'm ready to uh, move on to the next scene. This is a, uh, I brought it up earlier. This movie has a lot of iconic visuals. And as soon as I say where Lori Strode is at, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Now we're in the classroom with Lori Strode. And she's kind of, uh, you know, daydreaming a little bit, thinking. And, you know, she looks outside the uh, window and behind this car door, or behind this car, she sees the shape. 
she sees this this guy in a you know the mechanic jumpsuit and the uh, mask on just hiding behind <laughs> his car and just like she's like hold on what's that then I believe the teacher calls on her to uh, answer a question and she does it then she looks back and he's not there anymore um, this to me guys is one of my favorite you know just visuals of the entire movie and um and it's been reused in so many of the sequels. So many of the sequels. Right. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on this part of the movie and this visual? Man, the visual is so iconic because they even kind of tipped their cap to it. And Nightmare on Elm Street that we touched on last week with Nancy in the class. Like, just her being in the classroom in general is kind of, uh, that's Wes Craven's little tip of the cap to John Carpenter. Um, he even said that in the, uh, in the documentary. But, I mean, it's not... It's definitely not my favorite scene, but it's up there. Just because the first time you see it, you're really not... Ex- I mean, it's just this weird-looking figure just standing there behind this car. And if you were in the classroom, normal day, nothing weird, nothing out of the ordinary, really, and then all of a sudden you look out and there's this creep just looking at you through a window. There's nothing more realistic and scary than that. It's not some boogeyman man with ten legs and ten arms. It's not some you know, some mythical creature like even Freddy, it's this guy with a mask, an ugly mask and a mechanical jumpsuit. And and it's, I mean, it doesn't scare me. And the car's gone, by the way. That's another thing that, that always gets me. Sometimes I expect the car to still be there, but I got to remember, he drives the car off. And so you, it happens so fast. And and I, I love that scene a lot, man. Ron, what are your thoughts on this scene? I mean, I like the scene... This movie is, you know, like I said, like I said last week, the Nightmare on Elm Street. Me, a little bit of different things when you get a little bit older than you do when you watch it when you're younger. And uh, I used to love this movie so much. I think when I was little that I, I watched it either so many times or whatever that it's just almost to the point where it's almost not enjoyable to sit there and watch it again. And when I see that scene, like you guys are talking about, the, the thing I think about is, man, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street did that better, even though I know right. this is the original. And I know it, right. but to me, it's just, it's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking bad about it by any means. I'm not shitting on the movie by any means because I know and, and recognize how amazing right. and, you know, groundbreaking the movie is. It's just you know, kind of where I'm at, I think, with it. To right. Me, it just, uh, it really just, you know, piques your interest, really. It kind of right. like, it's, it kind of puts you in the thought of Lori's mind, just like, what did I just see? Yeah. Um, what the hell they, is going on here? <laughs> man, they tipped their cap to this scene almost too much in the in the most recent Halloween. They even go as far as to put you in the police car with, like, like so right after that scene, ah. there's a, a POV police car shot, and they're following Tommy. They even do that. Like, they like they really tip their cap to, 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 to this scene, not once but twice. And so, I mean... I like the scene. It's uh, again, it's my favorite horror movie. But they almost that that scene has been done so many times by so many different people that I'm kind of like, eh, okay. I mean, it still sets up a lot for further down the road. But like even Brian said, I, I agree. Nightmare on Elm Street did it the their classroom scene better. Oh, I agree. I agree. I think you could have cut. I think I think you could have cut that scene out and then just went to where you know where they're walking home from school to that, and then it it would make it better. And you could have shortened up her looking at Myers out the window. Like, I think that's an important shot that you needed to get, but you could have shortened it up. You could have skipped the question from the teacher. You, you could have even skipped him disappearing. Just, wow, I see you out the window, you're creeping on me, and then cut to the next scene. So, yeah, I mean, in hindsight, I know we're nitpicking here because, again, yeah. you know, there's a lot of iconic shots, but still, I agree with you. But then again, you also got to think this is, you know, when it came out versus we're talking about in 2019, right. you know. Right. Filmmaking has changed so much since 1978. Without question. Right. Brian, go ahead. Nico, I want to know what you think because of your comment last week's episode about the jump scares. This movie, and starting with starting with Tommy, I mean, that's what made me bring it up. Like, this movie's got nothing, almost nothing, but jump scares with the loud Halloween theme, you know, music popping up. So what do you think about it? Okay, um... Let me think of a specific jump scare. Okay, well, actually, that's going to be in the next scene where Tommy he gets bullied and he runs into the Yeah, right. Okay, um, well, before we do that, I want to say one more thing about this scene outside of the classroom, then I'll move on because I don't want to stay on too long. 
the, it sets to me. I think we're not as big a fans of it just because it got used so much in the sequels. This is my right. opinion. That's why. But, yeah. But um. But like in the next in the next few scenes, we're going to see. Um, let's see, what's her name? Annie and uh, Annie. Lori yep. Walking home. And we see Michael again behind the bushes. And now Lori's like, all right, this is the second time I've seen this guy. Then she goes into her house and sees him, you know, in the clothesline behind that. And we see she sees him again. To me, it just sets it up to like, all right. And the first time, it's like, what the hell was that? The second time, I was like, all right, am I seeing things or am I crazy? Now the third time, I was like, somebody is stalking me right now. You know what I'm saying? But, um. All right, let me address the jump scare thing. After I re-listened to our first episode, I kind of didn't clarify. Um, I don't like false jump scares. Drew brought right. up the fact that if I was actually that person, would I be scared of a cat jumping out of a you know, cupboard or whatever? Yes, I would be. But if I'm a member of the audience watching that movie and I see a cat jumping out, John Carpenter uses his sound and his villain to scare us but he doesn't use a loud sound with a cat jumping out to scare us you know what i'm saying he uses when it when if you're a kid if you're a little kid and you run into a giant human being with a mask on <laughs> that will probably scare you yeah right yeah you know maybe maybe you want to nitpick it and say i didn't need the noise maybe but i didn't have a problem with that jump scare i don't have a problem with a jump scare that's not false I don't have right. a problem with a jump scare where the villain is actually doing something. A part of, uh, gotcha. Right. You know, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I like, one. right. Right. I, I like a little kid right. trick or treating and running into you, and then all of a sudden there's a noise. You know yeah. Because uh, yeah. it's kind of not respecting your audience that you can actually make the movie scary. That, I that's agree. my answer to it. No, dude, I agree with you 100%. Like, I, I think, like you said, a false jump scare is crap. Like, that's literally in there just to get the audience go, oh, wow. And, and to me, it's just cheap. And by the way, that's what Paranormal Activity sequels did. The first one did a really good job. The next, uh, It's like, man, that's not even supposed to be scary. You're just making your audience jump. And so this movie has some practical jump scares. Now, listen, again, there's a couple that it's like, eh, okay. But they use the music. They use the mood, the atmosphere of the movie to make an effective jump scare and so i mean at the end of the day i think it's done well it's not perfect but um i think they're effective jump scares at least like they make sense within the frame of the movie yeah yeah and then the, and we compare like for last week's get uh when you compare like the jump scares within the movie itself like you know nightmare on elm street only had like 10 true jump scares in the movie and this uh halloween had 14 but yeah. if you go down and you look at like if you look at the uh, the actual jump scare list, the way they actually de- describe it, there are things like what Nico was saying. You know, it's you know it's uh, a gun going off or you know or the uh, the motion sensor light turns on. You know those kind of things, stuff that look, is a normal happening, like not the the cat jumping out. Right. So um, yeah, that's I think. Just, just don't use a false jump scare, directors. Come on, be, be creative. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> so, off the jump scare thing for a second. At least in this movie, her friends are respectable-ish. Where Rob Zombie, I, well, hold on. I didn't say they're great. They're not great. We, we under, we understand that they're not great. They're just kind of there for kills, really. Uh-huh. But at, at least, and. In, in the first Rob Zombie remake, and the second one, you know, the Halloween 2, he gives Annie a little bit more to do, which is great because I love Daniel Harris. But in the first remake, the, I mean, they're literally sluts. <laughs> I mean, that, and that's a really mean term to use. But that's what they are in, how, in Rob Zombie's Halloween. Fast yeah. women. Right. In, the, <laughs> in this one, at least, they're, you know, they're, you can tell they're Lori's friend. They care about Lori. Yeah. yeah for, you know, you, know, they you could the sense their bond. Right, right. The other, the remake that kind of just feel like they're thrown together. So at least in this one, I sense that Lori, you know, Lori is actually a good girl. She likes her, you know, she likes her school. She likes what her life is like, or well, kind of at least. But she's also that shy. I don't talk to boys. I'm scared, you know, that kind of thing. So 
the character makes sense. And by the way, a bad jump scare in this movie is when Sheriff Brackett jumps out and it, oh, everyone's entitled to one good scare. Eh, that line is, the, the line is great, but the scene kind of sucks. I, I agree with that. All right. Y'all want to go on to the next scene, or we got any other thoughts real quick? All right. Um, so after after Michael, you know, follows Tommy or whatever, after he got bullied, now we're at with Dr. Loomis at a payphone, and he's heading to Haddonfield, and it's like the sign says like 70-something miles away. And, af- and after Dr. Loomis gets out of the uh, payphone, he knows there's an abandoned truck. And off in the distance... Beside the abandoned truck, we see a dead body there. So obviously Michael hijacked something after he ran out of gas. Now, now we're at the part where the three girls are all walking home from school, and Michael passes by in the car, and then Linda thinks it's somebody they know, and they're like, and she yells, and then all of a sudden Michael Gino slams on his brakes. Uh, he must have some elite hearing. Cause I, don't I was gonna say that's supersonic that. hearing. Yeah. Well, it is supernatural, so. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's just, you know, the car pulls over in the middle of the road, blah, 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 blah. Then they're like, then he pulls away. Then the girls all start walking home. Here's, I, I won't call it a nitpick, but it just doesn't make sense why the kids are trick-or-treating so damn early. Mm-hmm. Um, and now here's an, here's another cool scene to me. It's kind of creepy. Lori goes into her house. You know, she I think she either, she opens her windows, and she looks outside, and she sees Michael Myers behind the uh the sheets that are hanging up, he's just standing there looking at her. You know, I got that picture saved on my phone. It's just so it's such a cool <laughs> visual, man. It's just it's like, see, that's what that's what I was talking about earlier. It just sets up, you know, this this dude following this woman so good behind the bush, right? To, to end the, the behind the sheets. It's like, first of all, I don't know why she didn't call the damn police and say, hey, something's going on here. But um, what are your guys' thoughts on just that visual itself? Oh, it sticks. I think it sticks. Yeah, yeah. I think the whole scene is great. It's probably, I don't know. It's not my favorite scene, but it's close. I know I said that earlier, but I mean, the the clothesline visual is great. The part where Lori's on the phone, and it's or you you think it's Michael, but it's actually Annie calling mm-hmm. her. You know, you can't hear. You think it's Michael, but it's not. Like the whole is it or is it not? Like how is he able to call her? I mean, he was just standing outside like so the whole you know i really do like the whole scene and and like you said nico i have that picture saved as well it's such a creepy visual and uh by the way put yourself in 1978 where stalking really wasn't talked about all that openly like the stalking of women and this movie addresses it and i know that's kind of i know we talked about it before but that's something you could do in a horror movie where you can address real life stuff within the context of it being still a fun good horror movie you can still address real life stuff in 1978 that scared the crap out of people he's following her to school he's following her to, to her house she's following her while she's babysitting and, and and i think it's really good stuff it's it's a classic scene to me yeah i agree brian well i can't even <laughs> i can't even watch the scene anymore without that uh this jeff one that i've seen a million times where it's like it shows her and then it shows Michael, and it goes back to her, and it goes back to Michael's playing cards, and then it goes back to her, and Michael's out there with Jason. And it's, right, that, I, so I can't even watch that anymore without seeing that. But the the thing about this movie, and that I think all the sequels miss a little bit, is that like this movie takes its time with the killing. Like mm. Michael is stalking his prey, whereas most of the slasher movies, you know, want to get there quick and show you the blood and gore and it, it takes its time, so it kind of makes you as an audience member like cringe with anticipation a little bit. It makes you be patient to see these people die that you know is going to. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm going to kind of reference what Mike said. You just know, you're talking about the stalking thing. You got to think, like in 1978, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm big into like the history stuff of a lot, you know, just things that are going on. They didn't even develop a task force for serial killers until 1977. And that was the beginning of it. So you're talking about 1978 when these things are happening. They know, the audience knows all these, you know, articles about these uh, serial killers that they're starting to come out now. Now you got to basically you got him sitting there staring, stalking his guys, and he's watching them. You know, so it's it, it it was par for what was going on then. So they played upon 
the audience's minds like, oh my God, this can be like the circle. This can actually happen. This stuff's happening right now. So it made it a very intense moment for what's going on that on that day and time. After this scene, we're shown uh, Dr. Loomis and the Gravekeeper. This kind of is, this is the moment to me where the sheriff should have really took this, this shit serious. Keeper and Dr. Loomis, you know, they're going to the grave and they discover a grave site that's been dug up and that the headstone is missing. And who is it? Judith Myers. And uh, I don't know how really the sheriff doesn't put, you know, the pieces of the puzzle together. It's like, Michael Myers just escaped. The grave is dug up and the tombstone is missing. This doctor who, who you know, treated him for 15 years is telling you how dangerous this guy is. It's just... It's very, very poor police work, in my opinion. You know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Total inept. 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 Inept the two personified. I don't know. Is that another social issue we can talk about people well, not taking doctors seriously? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> man. I think... I don't know. A, a lot. And really, this... And we'll debate it another time, but since they're bringing in Sheriff Brackett back for Halloween, mm-hmm. uh, for Halloween Kills, the new sequel... Yes. Why are they bringing in an aptitude retired police officer back? Because he's familiar with it, maybe? Maybe he can, you know, do a better job? Especially since in this canon, Halloween 2 doesn't exist, which is the most... He's more important important in Halloween 2 than he is in this movie. Right. Right? I mean, so, anyway, that's another story. But, no, I I mean, you're right. And, by the way, I do love this scene. I know. I'm a little biased towards this movie. I love this scene. All the scenes are good, Mike. I I agree with you. This movie does a great job of being great scene by scene. Right, mm-hmm. right. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I understand what you mean. Right. I mean, I like the grave, the I like the graveyard worker where he blames kids, and it's clearly not kids that can rip a tombstone up out of the ground. It's, it's supernatural. Damn kids. Man child person, you know. So I mean, it's it's you know, oh these damn kids. No, no, no. It's not kids. It's 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 the brain of a child maybe, but that's about it. Yeah, Brian. Well, I mean. <laughs> They're probably bringing back Sheriff Brackett so that he could say, well, you know, that happened all those years ago, but it sure is not going to happen again. It's all over. It's all over. I'm walking into the in, into the Blumhouse production office and beating everybody's ass. You need it. You need I'll drive you. And they better not make him the new Loomis either. I'm going to be pissed. <sighs> there, there can never be another Loomis. I mean, well, they like, even, even, even in this scene, like, every line he has in this entire movie is iconic and quotable and you could put on a shirt and have Michael wear it right now. Mm. After um, after he leaves his great side, now we've got um, Annie and Lori in the car. Pretty sure that's uh, the marijuana that they're smoking. It might be a cigarette. I, don't, I really don't know. But um, It's marijuana. Yeah, Lori, Lori takes a puff. and Hi, hey, girl, Lori. Uh, <laughs> it kind of whoops her a little ass a little bit. She's coughing. She can't stop. They hook a left at the red light, and uh, they see, like, oh, no, it's my dad, it's my dad, it's the cops. So they throw it all out, and they pull up, and they're like, what's going on, what's going on? Somebody somebody <laughs> broke into the hardware store, and all they stole was rope, a Halloween mask, and uh, and knives. That's it. Nothing's More happening. ineptitude. More <laughs> ineptitude. Haddonfield police need to be investigated. Some of the bitches be better. Holy smokes. Knives, rope, and a Halloween <laughs> mask. Nothing, nothing is being planned here. There's nothing awkward about that at all. Going on at all. No, no, nothing to and see. And even better in the sequels, it keeps happening, and they keep saying, no, I don't think it's anything. I don't think Myers is back. I don't think. All horror sequels, I love the movies, but you throw the logic out the window. Oh, yeah. This is happening again. Come on, man. Just to touch on that real quick, Mike, I think people take slashers, don't take them serious. Watch them for what they are. I agree 100% with that. Entertainment. Yes. That's why I don't hate Resurrection, but let's move on. Uh, yeah, I, I, like, I, like the realistic, I like the realistic in it, too. But, I mean, as long as it's something that is probable that could happen, is there probably towns out there that have sheriff departments or whatever that are this bad? Yeah, there probably is. Oh, there probably yeah. is. Especially... Especially in 1970. Exactly. Oh, oh man, come on. Barney Fife over there, you know, probably doesn't even got a bullet in his gun. Golly, Andy. <laughs> now, as the two girls leave from talking to the, to uh, Andy's dad, um, Dr. Loomis shows up, starts talking to, the, uh, to him and says, 
hey man, this is a serious problem we got going on. I need you to, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. And then Michael drives right behind him. It's like, I mean, I guess that would be kind of hard to detect, but I mean, you know, just more an attitude on my part. But um, so after they talk and check out this hardware store, um, Dr. Loomis and the sheriff go to Michael's old house. And they discover a dead dog who is still warm. And Michael hates dogs for whatever reason. Michael is yes. not liked by PETA. We will throw that out there. PETA <laughs> Absolutely not. not. Michael Myers. So he started eating this dog, I guess. I guess you get hungry a little bit. Michael might be Asian. Who knows? Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, you can say that because you're he Asian. You can say it. No, no, no. That was the Asian that said that joke. The Asian on this podcast. It's not endorsed by the podcast as a whole. <laughs> Anyway, this is there. There is a jump scare in here that I think is kind of cheap. Doctor Loomis is looking out the window. He says Michael could have seen us walking up. Blah blah blah. Then like a piece of the roof or the gutter or whatever hits the hits the window. Mm-hmm. Eh. Ooh, like no, I don't like that scene either. That little shot, I'm not a fan. I'll agree with you guys on that. Skip you know, it. You know, it's just you know they're having more cop and doctor talk. Now we transition to. We're outside of Annie's house, and Michael is behind a tree looking at the house. Now we're starting to get to the good stuff, folks. I was going to say, this, so so as, as much as we nitpicked the first, I don't know, 35, 40 minutes of the movie, and rightfully so, the last act of this film is worth it to me. Like, the, the, the minute the movie, the sun sets, I'm in. I'm hooked every time. They get me every single time. Agreed. Well, and there's not a lot of, I mean, this movie is, this movie is short. I mean, you just sit there and watch it. You're just like, man, it's cut. It, exactly, you're right. I mean, that's what makes it even better is that there's no just junk 30 minutes of you know wasted dialogue. Like mm-hmm. this is, you know, mm-hmm. this is a really cut, very, very well seen. So you mean, so you mean they don't go into Michael's backstory where I'll sculpt it out of you, girl, and flappy titties. <laughs> <laughs> so Annie is babysitting this little girl. And Annie's got one thing on her mind, and it ain't babysitting this little girl. Hi, girl, Annie. Yeah, she's uh, she's not getting paid to do her job very well. Her, I guess, it's her boyfriend Paul calls. She wants to, she wants, he wants her to come pick him up so they can uh, do some extracurricular activities on Halloween. And um, she's making popcorn. This is actually a really good scene coming up. She spills butter all over her clothes, so she has to go outside and wash all her clothes. Mm-hmm. Because you know, you have to wash them right then, I guess. I guess butter just doesn't come out in clothes in 1978. Oh, no, I mean, come on. And the washing machine and dryer is outside in a whole different room. I wasn't born then, so I don't know how houses are set up. I guess it's different. But um, this is a very good scene where it creates a very, very tense moment, but we don't actually see Michael. Does anybody want to go over the washing machine scene? Like, well, I just, first of all, how do you lock yourself into this building, too? I, I was going to say, <laughs> I don't know how that happens. <laughs> and I mean, you got, uh, look, we can, we can talk about how how groundbreaking everything in this movie was, but to me, like, the, the girl that per- plays Annie is, like, her acting to me is just, I was so cringe no about it. No matter no what now, she's doing. Now, as far as, you know, attractiveness, even 40 years later, I'm I'm a fan. I'm a fan 41 years later, so. Yeah, but, uh, I, no. think, I think Linda does. Linda plays her role better than Annie plays her role. Yes. I'll agree with that. I agree. And, and that's just my opinion on that. Right, right. I agree with that. But right. anyway, um, she gets. She goes outside to wash her clothes. She somehow locks herself in the room somehow. She's going to wash them. Then Paul calls the house and the little girl answers the phone. He's like, go, go get her, go get her. I need to talk to her. I need to talk to her. So she goes outside. And the whole time, Michael doesn't enter this building, Mm-mm. but he's just walking around it, looking inside. It builds, it builds the tension. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you don't know what's exactly going to happen next with that. Right. If you've never seen this movie, you have no clue what's happening. It is a great scene. I, just like we said earlier, man, John Carver does such a good job of building the tension in this movie and just putting you on the edge of your seat. Fantastic. So the little girl comes out of there, opens the door for her. She goes inside. She's like, all right, so we're gonna get Paul. The girl's like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I want to watch this movie. She's like, Well, what if I get you to watch it with Tommy Doyle? Tommy Doyle, young, young, young love, my friend, young love. So Annie pawns uh, the girl on Tommy and Lori, 
Oh, God. Annie. Oh, you're so stupid. She goes back to the house. She tries to get in the car, notices the door is locked. So it's like, oh, I gotta get the keys. For some reason, the word keys is used a lot in this movie. Yeah, I noticed. And, um, she goes in the house, you know, fluffs her hair up, looks at herself, gets the keys to the car, goes back into the garage, opens the door all of a sudden without using the keys to open the door. Oh, I, I never noticed that. And how is that not like the most immediate red flag ever? Like the door was right. locked and now it's not locked. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But I will say this. That is something John Carpenter, that, that John Carpenter wants you to take note of. He wants you to notice after the fact, wait a minute, how the heck did you not notice anything? Like, the tropes that came later from horror movies where dumb, where, where a bunch of dumb teenagers get killed, he kind of makes, he kind of thought that was realistic. Like, hey, I'm young. They're not paying attention. I really don't, right. It's all innocence, kind of. Too much sex on the brain. That's right. Too much sex. And no doubt, that's, that's kind of where you are. Remember, I remember movie. them days. Yeah, I am. So I get it. Another another thing she should have noticed is the damn car was steamed up. How do you not? Know oh, exactly. Like you know, come on. Like the windows are all fogged up. You get up in there, look like you just had a set, uh, you know, a sack session in there, man. You know, how do you not t- pay attention to that? Yeah, she gets into the car that was locked. That was unlocked. The car is completely fogged over. And she goes to rub on fogs. Now she notices, like, oh, it's kind of kind of steamy in here. What's going on? Then you know we get another, we get a good sound play. I think I think the sound. Yes. Play, yeah. Right. I think the kill was kind of eh. Yeah. Right. Even for him, it's not a great kill. There is a great kill at about 15 minutes though. <laughs> yes. Yes, there is. Well, that's exactly that's exactly what I got written down. Is that the it's just a very forgettable kill, like wholeheartedly all the way around. Just I mean I don't know. Just didn't want to show blood, or you didn't want to be too gruesome, but. You know, hey, he could have cut her throat, he could have stabbed her, you know, through the chair. Uh-huh. It, was, it was just like a, a very, you know, it, peak bad acting by her, too, being sure. Yeah, she's not good. Yeah, that was, that was yeah. Her face but, was so bad in that movie. Yeah, go ahead, Drew. Oh, no, my bad. Uh, you, uh, the one I was going to say about the killing thing, it's almost kind of like, you know, did they kill her this way to kind of just kind of prove a point that, like, he's not always going to stab you know, slash, is that, is that what it is? You never know how he's going to be killing people. You know, maybe they just wanted to get your mind off. You know, hey, he's not going to, not to make it predictable, he's not going to slash everybody he comes across to kill. Right. That's plausible. I, still better than some of the, I still think it's it's better than some of the kills in Scream, which we've talked about. Stab. Oh, God. Wah, wah, wah. Stab wah, to wah. the back. Stab to the stomach. Stab to the face. But how good, Le- though, like, like Brian said, how good would it have been just for good to get a good old throw slash right there? Neck, neck pulled back, and it's a slow, like playing the violin. Well, One stroke. Saying, they were limited on the budget on kills. So they had to kind of pick and choose their kills wisely. And then I think that he just kind of, I mean, in the documentary that I've watched, he just kind of decided that... Uh, some kills have to be great, and some people we just have to get away out of this story. And so he picked he he definitely look. Michael only kills how many people in this movie? Three, four, 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 four people. Yep. Four. Yeah. So you know he's not you know in most in most movies the kill counts a lot higher. Mm-hmm. And so I guess he saved two he he saved two really good kills. But I mean the kills in this movie are kind of a good point to me because the later sequels have really really awesome kills and this movie just kind of just it's just kind of you know and you don't even so yeah i mean that's my point i mean i guess for 1978 even for 1978 some of these kills suck i will say that good well you got to think too about the i mean and i don't know this for a fact this is just me talking off cuff but maybe the mpaa had something to do with that i think so true 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 true. things a lot differently back then he might have might have you know gotten an x rating something like that. Right. I didn't even think about that. That could be yes. definitely there. Right. That's a very good point. But there was, you know, a naked girl at the beginning, but we'll go ahead and move on to, um, but like you said, the next two kills after this one are very good to me. Uh, um, John Carpenter has a nice product placement in the next scene. <laughs> Lori and Tommy are watching The Thing, which hasn't even come out yet on TV. <laughs> um, 
which I think is great. Yeah. yeah. I actually haven't seen that movie yet, but um, I'm looking forward to watching it. Trey Rowland, shout out to the Rollcast. He said it's his favorite movie, so we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely check it out. It's a good um, one. It's a good one. You're definitely not wasting your time on it, that's for sure. No, no. No, it's good, especially the ending, but anyway. Hey, I asked him that question on my podcast, by the way, so there's a little product placement for a show we hadn't even recorded at that point. So there you go. Huh. <laughs> All right, here's another real cool, well, a real cool scene. We'll, we'll go over it real quick. Um, you know, it's Halloween. The kids are in town, are playing, you know, pranks, getting dared to do stuff. Lonnie, the bully from earlier, his friends, they walk up to Michael Myers' old house. Dr. Loomis has been on house watch the whole night. He's hiding behind the bush. And as Lonnie walks up the stairs, he sees, or Dr. Loomis sees it, and he hides behind the bush. Lonnie, get your ass away from them. They take off running, they're horrified. <laughs> Then this is where the, this is an effective scare for Loomis, but not us. The cop taps his shoulder and he turns around. Oh, you scared me! You scared me! And mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Right, cop says, "Yeah, nothing's really going on tonight besides you know regular Halloween stuff." But now we're gonna let's just go ahead and get into um, for time reasons. Let's go ahead and get on to Linda and Bob. They get to Annie's house. And we got two more teenagers with nothing but some uh, sexual intercourse on the mind. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they go in, lay down on the couch, blah, blah, make out. And they call Lori. And they're like, have you talked to, uh, what's her name, Annie? Yeah, have you talked to Annie? She ain't here. We don't know what's going on. He's like, oh, she went to get Paul. They must have did something. You know, must have stopped somewhere. So my man Bob and Linda go into the room, and they have a jack and lantern right beside the bed to create the good vibes <laughs> this is to me a really good part of this scene is just the fact that michael myers walks right by the room and you can see the shadow mm-hmm. oh mm-hmm. they do that so well yeah so well so well I, to me the way they did this these next few sequences is so much better than in like um jason part two where he stabs both of them with the spear i like the way they do this better than you know, just killing them both at the same time with the sex. So, Michael, do you want to do Bob's death? Because I know this is probably all of our favorite death. Yeah, oh, man. Yes. The way, the way that he... Okay, so, I mean, you kind of... In hindsight, I kind of almost want Bob and Linda to die, too. I know. It's kind of... It's kind of... But, no, man, I mean, it, it's just... Uh, the way that he kills Bob is great. It's an all-time classic kill scene. Uh... The way he, you know, hangs him up there on the wall by a knife, I think it's great. Um, and the, and really, it's not so much the kill; it's the way you see Michael's mind work when he just kind of tilts his head back ever so slightly, like admiring his work. Like he's like, ah, oh, that was fun. Like he's just kind of, hmm. He's looking at Bob up there on the wall. Like I really like that kill, man. And the way and the. Uh, not so much the kill itself, because the kill is what it is. The, I, I actually think they do that kill better in the in the remake. That's like one of the very few things. But uh, I I freaking love uh, I love the kill. I love the way Michael is just sitting there admiring his work on the wall, like he's an artiste. Yeah. Almost. It's really it lets you into the mind. Oh wow, this guy's freaking nuts, man. Well, and and I mean Carpenter picked Myers. Um, weapon of choice than the butcher knife based on this kill because I think it, it was a uh, let's see a 17 inch chef's knife from um, and it just specifically so it could be realistically go through a person and hang somebody up on the wall mm-hmm. um, you know as far as the scene I mean obviously it's probably the most iconic you know kill in this movie the franchise period probably and I mean because of Nick Castle's performance, like I said earlier, with his little ticks and him, you know, tilting his head, like Mike said. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot else you can say about it. Watch, I'm literally watching it right now. Freaking awesome, man. <laughs> I'm at the uh, scene where Annie's left, locked in the uh, washing machine right now. Drew, you got any thoughts on this Bob scene real quick? I don't know. I'll just say the quick thing is, like, the, the scene itself is, is obviously my favorite favorite one of the whole way. Just the way Michael's talking about, too. Like, you know, just standing there and just enjoying what he just did like just soaking every every last second of it so he can remember it It just seemed like he wanted to remember killing this dude and laying him up there like that he just wanted to remember forever 
I will say that the characters in this movie don't really pick on what red flags look that good because uh, he <laughs> after he goes to the refrigerator or whatever he looks and sees like the door was open he's like oh, yeah no big deal play? somebody's playing a prank oh you're funny funny well 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 remember I mean he's afterglow I mean he's in that sex afterglow bro I was gonna say he wants to get back to top of his girlfriend you know come on I respect it. Right. Like y'all said, real quick before I move on to Annie's or Linda's death, just the fact that they use the sound of this death so great. Like there's a sound whenever Michael first comes out and he stabs him, then the sound cuts. Right. But then you just see Michael staring at this guy. He just stabbed to the wall. Such such a great scene. I really like Bob's death. So now we got another another really cool visual. Michael puts on. Bob's glasses <laughs> on top of a sheet, and he walks into the room where Linda, uh, where Linda is. And here's another. One. I don't know why Linda doesn't pick up on the fact that he doesn't say anything at all, because Bob really was just talking his, you know, he was talking nonstop just a few minutes ago. But um, he's like, "Where's my beer? Where's my beer?" Doesn't say nothing. So she's like, well, "Screw you! I'm just gonna call." Uh, and it shows it. She whips the tatas back out one more time. There you go, Linda. She's like, well, screw you if you're not going to talk. I'm going to call Lori. So she calls Lori, and as soon as Lori answers, we get another strangled death. But this strangled death, I don't have a problem with. What do you right, right. About this? Yeah, agreed. I right, I agree. For, for four kills, I don't really like there being two strangled, but I like this strangled death. Yeah, I like it because mostly because it's, it's almost like he's like, okay, I made a great kill right before. I'm going to leave that knife there, and it's what can I use now that's around me? Right. To make my next kill. And obviously with her being on the phone, easy peasy. Right. And for as much as, for as, much as, as people talk about Jason in his movies, just taking the time to take a body and go hide it somewhere just so it'll be found later, dude. Michael Myers is the OG. This dude will take a sheet, dress up, use glasses, drives a car around. He just, you know, he didn't play around. <laughs> right. Mike, you, did you like this kill? I mean, the kill is what it... I mean, the kill is what it is. You know, it's a strangulation kill, so nothing like to really, you know, harp on there. But the see, I, I mean, my favorite part is you another peek, another peek inside Michael Myers, where he's playing with people. Yeah. And uh, he he he's put the sheet on. He's got Bob's glasses, and and if you're Annie, even though Michael Myers looks a little bit taller, he's not like superhumanly tall in this movie, which I think is great. Uh, but I uh. He, he looks like Bob. Uh, of course you think it's Bob. And so she, the fact that Michael just, again, playing with his victims, like he knows I'm going to kill her, but I might as well have a little fun with this first. I mean, I think that's a great peek inside the mind of the character. So that's why well, I like that too. And I think that harkens back to his childlike nature. Yep. Mm-hmm. Still. I mean, he's not mature. He's still a child kind of at heart, but without – any emotion, any emotional ties to anything, any right. just basically pure evil embodied. Yep. That sounded like Lemons right there. You did? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, after Linda's death, you know, she makes, you know, all the weird strangle noises. Lori thinks it's just a prank, a sex joke, whatever. But she starts to get suspicious, so she goes across the street to check it out. The house is pitch black. She discovers Annie laying on the bed with a tombstone on it, which is a great visual. Great visual. Like, awesome. Like, oh, God. Oh, God. Then she finds, um, you know, the other two bodies along in the house. And then there's a really cool scene where Michael comes out from the closet, I guess. Mm-hmm. From the pitch black, all you see is just the mask and her up against the wall. She pushes. She ends up falling over the stairs onto the, like, what is that, the stairway or something? Onto the stairs. I could have broke her neck, I don't know, but she survived it somehow. She, so she runs outside and fuck these neighbors, by the way, which, yeah, but it's like, if a, if somebody is, like, beating on your door. Yeah, help, help, like, yeah. It's like 1978, supposed to be, like, a happier, you know, a time where we, like, trusted people more now. Like, I can understand in 2019 not trusting nobody, but back then people were, like, more courteous, you know? Yeah, most people didn't even lock their doors still back then. Yeah, it's just like. Right. How could you not open the door for a girl pleading for help? I, that, I don't know. I, I didn't fuck the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so, fun, so fun behind the scenes fact, since it kind of ties into the last week. The house that Lori lives in, in in California is on the other side of the street and a house down 
from the uh, uh, Nancy's house in, in Nightmare. Really? Huh. Uh, like they're on the set. Right, right. They filmed pretty close in location, pretty close proximity. It's on. It's pretty much all there on Sunset Boulevard, both houses. You can still go there. Now, there's someone that actually lives in the Elm Street house. Like someone actually lives there, so I don't think they love it that much. But um, as far as the proximity, they're really closely filmed to each other. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. After this, um, Laura runs back to her house where the kids are. She can't get the kids to wake up, so she throws, like, I think it's a potted plant out of the wall or whatever. So she, Tommy walks down real slow. Another kid who's in no hurry, but I guess he would be in no hurry either. Uh, my kid would be booking it down the hall. I mean, he would, yeah, he would definitely not be like, okay, whatever. So he, she, he opens the door and she gets inside. She tells the kids, all right, the boogeyman is coming. Um, Here's something I didn't know. I didn't. I really didn't understand how Michael got inside the house so fast because she's like sitting on the couch and he just pops up out of nowhere behind her. And uh, I like that sad. scene. I know. I, I really like, like that scene too. Right. But how he right. got in so fast is just crazy to me. So she stabs him in the neck with was like a sewing pin. I think is what it is. It's like a yeah. It's like a sewing pin or yeah yeah. It's something like that. She stabs him in the neck with a sewing pin. She thinks he's dead. So. Um, she goes and tells kids, I killed him. So she runs up the stairs. Then all of a sudden, like, he's dead, he's dead. So we see Michael walking up the stairs like, well, crap, he's not dead. <laughs> so, the, so the kids take off. Here's kind of a, here's a great scene, but a confusing scene to me. She gets into the closet. I love the scene, but I know it, yeah. She, she gets in the closet. And we've seen Michael just break down a door with his bare hands, but now he's struggling, like, to open a closet. Mm-hmm. Who was it? Right. Let me hear your thoughts on this closet scene real quick. Yeah, that's that, that's the same thing that I have an issue with. Is like I said earlier, they can't decide whether he's he's human or whether he's you know kind of supernatural. Uh, does he have supernatural strength? Well, he does sometimes when it's you know when it's right. needed. But uh, like as far as the scene, just I think. It, and I think probably in their minds, I'm jumping in the director's minds a little bit, he's probably, they're probably trying to, all right, now we're going to put her in a very enclosed space so it seems claustrophobic. And, you know, just trying to build, you know, the scare factor and a little bit more tension to it. Right. And, you know, it's it definitely works because, you know, you can't think about this movie without this scene. I agree, Mike. Right, I agree. I mean, this, the shot is iconic. You know, him reaching through the closet and rummaging around and stuff, that's, you know, that's used, heck, that's used in JIT form for stuff. Mm. And so, so, I mean, even in 2019, that scene remains classic. And so, I mean, no, there's some, there's some stuff there, like you've mentioned, Liko, that, man, you can't just rip this closet apart, man. <laughs> like, but as far as suspense, the way they use the music, the way that they kind of take you inside the closet with Lori, they do a really good job with that, man. So the scene is shot really well. The cinematography is great. The music is great. The atmosphere is great. So it, it makes for a classic scene. Drew, you got any quick thoughts? No, I don't have anything that's already been, everything else has been said on them right along with those lines. So she, she's in the closet. Michael finally breaks through, but she grabs a metal coat hanger. She straightens it out and pokes him. Hell, hell of a stab. I love that. <laughs> pokes him right in the eyeball. So he, he bounces back, drops his butcher knife. She grabs the knife and stabs him in the stomach, and he falls over. There might not be stuff, I can't remember where it was. She stabs him with a butcher knife. He falls over. And here's where Lori's really starting to get on my nerves how dumb she is in this movie. <laughs> it is annoying. It is annoying. Yeah, it is. She, she just stabbed the man in the neck with a pen, and he got back up. You poked him in the eye, and then you stabbed him. And instead of, you know, running out of the house completely, you just stand at the doorway not even looking at Michael. Which is a great scene whenever he sits up, but it's like, oh my God, Lori, what are you doing? You're smarter than this. You're supposed to be the nerd girl, probably right. or something. But um, so he gets back up. He attacks her. He's getting ready to. The, the kids are outside yelling, help, help, help. Doctor Loomis finds them. So Doctor Loomis goes in the house, and Michael's about to finish off Lori. But Doctor Loomis comes in the house, gives him the. Uh, she rips his mask off, and we see his face. Then Dr. Luma shoots him, what, five or six times? Then he falls off the balcony and onto the ground. And um, Lori, you know, she's up against the wall. She says, 
was that the boogeyman? <laughs> yes, it was. And then Dr. Loomis looks over the balcony. And that's the end of the movie, but um, what's y'all's oh. thoughts on the very end of the movie? Go ahead, Drew. I, I think the ending could have been a, a little bit better, a little bit more right. cleaner, maybe. Um, but I mean, again, it's set it's setting up that, that later on. Like you know, I don't I don't write movies. I could never write a movie. So actually coming up with this and setting it up, you know, it's easy to sit to sit back and say, you know what, it could have been better like this by being nitpicky right. or whatever. But you know, it could have been better. I don't hate it though. That's why I'll leave it at. I, I it could have been better, but I don't hate it. Right. Brian, what are your Oh, um, I actually like the ending. For as much as I prep on the movie, I really don't hate this movie. The, uh, I mean, I, I really actually do like the ending. I like the fact that it leaves it a little bit, like I said, more open to, well, I mean, oh, we thought this dude was a, uh, just a regular person, but and he just got shot six times, and um, he's obviously just got up. So, And obviously they expand a little bit on that in Halloween too, which I honestly really love that movie, so it bothers me that they try to write it out. But... Um, and it expands on it a little bit more, but, you know, especially how he's bleeding and, and running from house to house, I believe, in the, in the, the beginning of the second one. But uh, I really like how they left it open, honestly. Mike, what are your thoughts on the ending of this movie? I know it's your favorite. I'm going to agree with Brian. I mean, I, I think it's really well done. I mean, you got to think, this was supposed to be a one-off movie. Uh-huh. Sequel was not in the mind. They never, John Carpenter never wanted to do a sequel. He wrote Halloween 2 over a six pack of beer and like a, a uh, you know a one night span and so again you gotta picture it as this was supposed to be a one off was he superhuman was he not superhuman you know like what you know they leave it really open ended now I could have lived without the Loomis gunshot quite frankly I would have rather had Lori kind of triumph there but I understand why Loomis had to be the one like it makes sense f- from a story arc standpoint but other than that I, I love the ending I think it uh, it's just like Brian said, it leaves it really open ended, and I think that was the intent was to man, what did we just see? Uh-huh, I, you know, uh-huh. and, and for audiences, I think that made it even more scary because at the time, that kind of stuff was really in vogue, and and I, uh, it's a classic scene. It, it and this uh, again, this is where the music and the atmosphere and the way it was shot really helps. Again, you're on a shoestring budget, the script isn't great, and so you got to make the most of it, and they make the most of it in that scene, and. Uh, yeah, I, it's not, again, it's not even my favorite ending in the franchise, but I really do, I love it. And to touch on what Brian said about Halloween 2, I normally watch these movies back to back. And so I, it's like one really long movie. And so I think when you watch it like that, Halloween 2 makes a lot more sense. But this movie was supposed to just be a standalone, and for that I think it's done really well. I agree. I, I like the ending. I mean, the only thing I really just didn't like was just, Glory being stupid, yeah, <laughs> in a lot of situations, and, and obviously very strong to be able to stab with a you know like a clothes hanger like that right. like through somebody's skin. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, she's very cognizant of that, which is why twice now she's done two different movies with two different timelines to try to course correct that Lori is not this idiot, weak person. She's strong. She's She's clearly suffering from grief and all that. So she's tried to kind of course correct that. But when you just watch this first movie, as she's just your typical, everyday, average, dumb teenager like the rest of us were. Yeah, I figure we just uh, our, do our favorite kill and least favorite kill real quick like we did last week. My favorite kill was Bob, obviously. I just like the not only the kill itself, but just, you know, the, the scene, the, the sound. The, the way Michael gives him the head bob or whatever, just looking at it, what he just done. And my least favorite was Annie, just because it was kind of, kind of a boring kill. Right. I agree with everything you said. Favorite is Bob, least favorite is Annie. Drew? I'm right there with you, boys. Brian? Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm the same way with Bob's being my favorite, but honestly, I think honestly all of the kills besides Bob's are kind of forgettable, if we're going to be honest. Yeah, I yeah. agree with that. Yeah, yeah, like Linda's death, the uh, scene with Michael in the uh, in the sheet and the, the glasses is more iconic, I think, than the actual kill. Um, let's rate the movie real quick out of one to one to ten. Drew, you want to go first this week? Uh, I would, I, I'll give it a solid eight. A solid eight. Mostly because you know it's, there was some good in there, but 
the total package of it, the music being uh, put in there and just the 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 stalkiness of the whole movie just kind of kept you like guessing with it. So I'd give it a solid straight eight. I'm going to give it a little bit higher rating only because all of the tropes that you roll your eyes right. at in this movie are the ones that are just, you roll your eyes at it because they're repeated and copied, you know, for, for, you know, decades afterwards in every single one. But the fact that this thing started everything, I mean, I gave Nightmare on Elm Street a nine. So, I mean, it's right there. I mean, a nine, nine point five. I mean, it's almost, like I said, that's why it's copied so many times. It's just almost the perfect movie. And right. Hey, look, this is how you make a scary movie on a low budget or a low budget to have the biggest returns so um that's far ahead mike go ahead and give us that 10 i want to hear a 10 <laughs> it's not a perfect 10 man i <laughs> it's a 9.5 for me clearly it's my favorite i'm biased towards it i defend it for its its faults but i can acknowledge its faults as well there's some stuff that doesn't age well and when you see some of the later stuff you know the gore the way the kills were better later on down the road. Um, but just from a pure story standpoint, from a pure doing things first, doing things right, using what you had at your, uh, you know, using what you had at your disposal for, you know, the, the budget, it's a 9.5 to me, man. That, and by the way, I think this movie might be like a five and a half without the music. Like I, I, like, I mean, the, the music, it's like Drew said, going way back to the beginning of this conversation, is the character in this movie. It makes the movie, the way they use the, the way they use the music and the way they use the camera for certain shots, just really, it takes it up a notch. And Michael Myers is my favorite, uh, is my favorite slasher person. So it gets a little bump for that. So nine and a half. That's fair. Um, yeah, I wrote down my rating was a nine. Um, and honestly, in the past, I tweeted that I thought it kind of was overhyped, but when I watched this movie on Wednesday and I like took notes on it and like really really paid attention to it, I was like, I I, I get why it's hot as much as it is. I mean, I wrote down it's a classic, it's an icon, it set the stage for all future slashers. Um, it has some corny moments, but you know the atmosphere, the sound, the tension, the build up, the slow burn of the movie, it all still works to me. You know, what 41 years later, right? And um. They're still making Michael Myers movies, you know. That he's he still he's scary to you know people our age and people ten years younger than us and people ten years older than all of us. Right. You know? So I mean, everyone. And, and another thing, I, I know we've all touched on it, but the Michael thing, the dun 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 dun, that thing, it's just it's that's, me, it's, 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 that, that's the best horror thing sound to me of all of them. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, Freddy's got, you know, he's his got good stuff. Jason's got the pop pop stuff. That's good. But the, the Michael Myers theme is the best. I love that theme, man. That theme is, man, I've worked out to that theme. I love that theme so much. Yeah, I've got I've got a dubstep version of it. Right, it's, it's great. Oh, no, yeah. No, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And before before we wrap it up, I just got, we got one fan question from uh, Danny C. She's, uh, we appreciate, hey, Dan, I want to thank you for interacting with the account a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you for everyone who interacts with the account. Go ahead, Mike. I see your hand raised. No, that's a friend of mine from Georgia. Oh, shout yeah. out to Mike's friend from Georgia. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, she has a question, and I'll let Mike go first since it's his, his friend. Why do people always think they're safe in their bed? <laughs> no idea. I really don't know. I guess I. it's just supposed, it's kind of like the classroom where it's one of those safe those uh, those safe spaces to use no. a trigger word from these days. No. I guess that's that's really the only thing I can think of. It's just one of the places you're supposed to feel safe. And in horror movies, you should know never lay down. Like oh. don't don't go to sleep. Don't have sexual relations. Don't do anything in your bed because you're probably gonna die. Brian, what you, what's your answer to why do you think people always say they're safe in bed? Honestly, I think it was the reason why last week I said that Elm Street is so scary because you know. It, it's it's supposed to be your safe spot. It's supposed to be. It's where you're most vulnerable. It's where you're asleep. It's where you know you feel the safest. And I think that horror movies play on that and try mm-hmm. to make it you know scarier and like I said more psychological to uh, to play on where you supposed to feel the safest is where you obviously you'll retreat to. And um, you know in Freddy's in, you know Freddy's world you're 
obviously not safe at all. So. Mm. Why do you think people think they're safe in bed? I have no idea why they think that because if I hear some random, <laughs> hear a random ass song, uh, sound that's like you know even remotely questionable, I am not going under my sheets. I'm getting up. I'm going to grab my pistol and I'm going to walk towards the sound. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, I yeah, mean, I, there's been times. I mean, there's this. I, I will legit tell you the story, but like there's one time, like I don't know what it was, but something in the house fell, and it was just me. The kids were like at their their dad's house and. uh Carlos was in South Korea at the time, and I legit got up, went to my closet, and got my golf club. I was freaked out, man. There's no way I'm just going to sit there. You know what? These covers will keep me safe. The invisibility cloak. No, I don't get it, but I understand, like Mike said, you know, it's they play on it. I mean, like y'all said, they play on it. It's supposed to be your safe zone, but in reality, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't keeping you safe. I agree, man. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I can think of is, you know, I... I guess you feel safer if you hide your head under the, pill- the blanket, the pillows. I guess you just pretend nothing's out there if you just... Yeah, I really don't know, Dan. You know, that's a good question, uh, and I don't think any of us know the answer, I guess. No. Like, I guess you just rather not know and not see what's going on than actually see it. That's my only thing. So, uh, cough, cough, I FSU football. I um, want to say thank you to everybody tuning in. And... Uh, Next week, you're going to definitely want to be tuned in for the uh, Mike versus, uh, or the Mike and Brian versus Drew uh, episode of the debate on screen. This is going to be an entertaining one. I think I'm just going to be kind of neutral in this one. <laughs> so real quick, before we go into that, ready. before go we go ahead. into that, Drew, you like Scream, correct? As a movie. I like Scream as a movie, yes. I do. Okay, okay. so that- end it right there, and we'll go in, so we'll let everyone know next week. We'll have a little hook there. It'll be right. it'll be worth a listen, fellas and ladies. Right, right. Chris right. Buffer to open the uh, thing next or to open the pod next week. <laughs> He's like, well, man. Well, now, He's that, like, now that he likes it, it might not be too bad. Oh no, it's gonna get bad. Oh, uh, I got I got some really great takes, but we'll, we'll we'll leave it there. Thank y'all for listening. Yeah, we appreciate it, guys. Appreciate it. And let us know any feedback if you have it. Appreciate it, guys. And I uh, just want to remind everybody to uh, don't do it.